so how did I start Kinosmith? Uh, it's actually a really good question. Uh, I had a long history in the film industry. I mean, I'll go way back. I went to film school to actually learn to make films, thinking I could make films. Uh, I realized I was nothing more than a pretentious idiot back in film school. And uh, the one thing of being four years at York University, I learned how to use the camera and editing, but I had no idea of the industry. And I think that's one of the big downfalls of a lot of film schools out there, that they teach you the art, but not necessarily the industry. So I purposely came out of York and wanted to work in distribution to understand how you finance a film, how do you get a film made. Um, from there, I sort of jumped to places like the National Film Board of Canada, uh, Toronto International Film Festival. Uh, I got my first job in distribution at Alliance back when Robert Lantos was still there. Um, it's funny, it's about every two years I sort of switch jobs. From Alliance, I went to Black Watch, which was kind of a notorious company back in the day. Um, uh, I could get into colorful stories another time, but let's just say they, our big hit was Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, which grossed over $17 million, and suddenly, magically, the company had no money in their bank. Uh, I ran away very quickly from Black Watch to Lionsgate. Um, I worked in the Toronto office, but my boss was based out of LA, and uh, from Lionsgate went to Seville Pictures. Um, from for Seville, I went to Capri releasing, where we triggered away from her. Um, as one of many films, and then as Capri got close to releasing away from her, uh, there was trouble with the company, the company started losing staff, and I ended up leaving Capri just before the film got released, um, and really had nothing to do, but I stepped getting phone calls from people, uh, filmmakers, sales agents who I dealt with in previous jobs, who had product but wasn't finding any home in it. So initially I started by just acting as a service agent. Um, I would work with people like Seville Pictures on booking their films theatrically for them in English Canada, and TVA, and various other companies. And then I started taking a few films aboard, such as um, Ten Canoes, a great Australian Aboriginal film, and the big claim to fame was Up the Yangtze. Uh, where I worked with I Steel Film out of Montreal, and that was a film that every Canadian distributor passed on. And between myself working in my basement and the filmmakers working out of their office in Montreal, we ended up achieving the third highest grossing Canadian documentary of all time. I think it's close to $700,000 box office, which uh, selfishly I really love, not only as a branding mechanism for me sort of doing something on my own, but kind of showing to everybody that you don't need a huge office, a huge infrastructure um, to necessarily do hard work and get great success. So after Yangtze, I realized uh, there was some industry interest on who I was and what I was doing. So I started Kinosmith, mostly as kind of a servicing company where I would take projects aboard, where the filmmakers still hold onto rights, but I would help navigate them out into the theatrical marketplace or try to get a broadcast deal for them, write marketing plans for uh, projects in development. And suddenly I realized there was a real gap in the marketplace. I mean, the, the notorious figures like Alliance, uh, it wasn't Entertainment One back in the day. It was, um, God, I can't even remember what they called themselves before. Let's say Odeon Films, Entertainment One, and even Mongrel Media, who was the notorious sort of niche boutique distributor, had grown by leaps and bounds. And no one in English Canada was that boutique distributor anymore. And um, as I saw with Up the Yangtze and a bunch of other films, there was a bunch of smaller films, I'll say smaller in the context of a large commercial success, were just kind of slipping under the radar and no one was doing anything with it. So um, without even a full-fledged business plan, I sort of started Kino Smith once again by myself in my basement um, and started acquiring some projects and working them around. Six years later, uh, we're still a small company, it's a company of three people, still work out of the house, um, but we've now released over 120 films in the marketplace. We still service films for other distributors as well, um, but we've really specialized on picking up feature-length documentaries, foreign language films, Canadian independent films. We've been triggering films with Telefilm. We've been buying films at international markets. and. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's kind of where it is. It's been kind of a weird ride. I, I wouldn't have necessarily anticipated being like this, and nor would I ever categorically compare myself to other distributors because the size of what we do and the scale of what we do is always much smaller. But there's been an obvious need, so much so that there's so many products still to this day that are floating around that even a small company like us wouldn't be able to necessarily handle it. So there was obviously the industry 
accepted who we were, almost wish there was a few more of us, you know. I think Ron Mann does a great job at films we like, and he's a guy I fully embrace. Never see him as c competition. He's a guy, if he picks up a film I want, I actually get really excited about it, and vice versa. Uh, and that's the kind of environment I like to work in. So when I started my own little uh, venture, and Up the Yanks, he got great success, Obviously, Telefilm was immediately uh, impressed, I can say, quite confidently, and um, made it very well known that if I wanted to apply as a quote-unquote official Canadian distributor, that they would uh, definitely embrace that. Um, so I thought about it and thought about, you know, the pros and cons. I mean, one of the problems in the Canadian film industry is if you're waiting to buy a great Canadian film when it's completed and shown on a festival, chances are someone else already owns it. The way the funders work is essentially they require a distributor attached. So I fig figured, whether it be fictional films or non-fictional films, to have that triggering status and, and get involved with a project like we did with Away From Her back at Capri, from script all the way to screen, would be a great way for us to find some great projects and take them all the way through. Um, it's never as easy and simple as that. Uh, you know, I, obviously Telephone has been really fantastic to us as an organization. and. Uh, I think very similarly to other companies, sends projects our way that think fit our, our sort of style and our size. Um, but there's only a handful of Canadian, English Canadian distributors out there, including myself. And yet there's hundreds and hundreds of Canadian projects out there. So we started triggering films like Ed Gaston Lee's Small Town Murder Songs, Chess Thorne's Whirly Gig, uh, and a variety of other projects. And for a small company like ours, because it's such a long gestation period from development to actually releasing and starting to see revenue come in, it does tax a smaller company like us. I mean, there's, a, there's issues of cash flow and so forth. Um, there's also the, the, the harsh reality of what you read in a script isn't necessarily what you see on screen. Um, and I get that. A lot of things happen along the way. But once again, because we're a smaller company with a, a finite amount of cash flow, we could only invest in so many of those projects without really straining ourselves and, and really doing a disservice to the other projects that we were already getting involved in. Um, so we are still triggering films, although I always say about two to three a year max, depending on their budget size. And um, Telefilm also has said to us, you know, knowing our size, there's only a certain budget that we can get involved with, you know. Traditionally speaking, it's around $3 million in under production, and that's fine for me because, you know, if we had a full proof or a, a, a passion deal come through our door, I just know we wouldn't have the capital or the resources to put a multi-million dollar campaign behind these films. I also selfishly don't think those are the type of movies our industry should be trying to tackle as well. Um, so it kind of conveniently works out both ways. But so far, Telefilm's been really good and they've encouraged us to keep going forward with projects. We're probably triggering more documentaries than fictional films right now. Um, and the advantages of that would be, you know, having involvement in a doc at an early stage helps us secure rights for a film before perhaps even a broadcaster gets involved and starts taking broadcast rights, VOD rights, online rights. Um, so it gives us a little bit more of a, a powerful footing in regards to establishing uh, how we can recoup our investment on a film by end of day. Uh, Hot Docs is one of the, the key organizations we developed a really strong strategic partnership with recently. Um, it all started first off with us proposing doing a Hot Docs collection on DVD. Uh, since we're acquiring all these great award-winning documentaries that often played in Hot Docs, it seemed it makes sense to see if hot dogs would help let us utilize their brand to help sell feature documentaries to, Can to Canadians on a, on a larger market. And they were very receptive, really great about it. And uh, that has developed into further sort of strategic relationships to where I'm at now, which is running Kinosmith as well as on the side programming the new cinema that you see around here, the Blur Hot Dog Cinema, uh, which is a bit of a dream gig. Um, I'm not sure how I'm going to manage the hours over the years coming forward, but we'll see, day by day. Well, DVD is kind of a dying art form, I hate to say it. You know, I mean, Canada is such a small market. Even back when DVD was healthy, it still wasn't a huge, substantial amount of revenue for, I'll say, niche films. I mean, there still is a strong market for sell-through DVDs, sell-through being DVDs you buy at Walmart or Best Buy or wherever. Um, where my films that we released were often categorically put were in rental markets. Um, 
That's where you put the more challenging films, the uh, upscale films, the foreign films, dare I say the Canadian films. Uh, and of course with Blockbuster closing, Rogers closing half of their stores across the market, uh, the whole DVD market itself collapsing, it's now become really problematic to get a smaller title to release on DVD and quite often, not just me, but from what I hear from the other distributors, they're saying to Canadian filmmakers uh, very upfront that chances are they're not going to do a DVD release on it because the cost of authoring, mastering, replicating, shipping versus the demand is, is now really um, so low that it's almost, um, it's hard to recoup. So that's kind of the dire situation I see within our industry right now is, um, you know, DVD had notoriously always been a huge revenue generator for films. Uh, the, the irony of the pie graph is, you know, for non-Canadian films, they'll say, DVD used to, as little as four years ago, produce as much as 60, 70 percent of the, the revenue a film would actually generate. But now that DVD is dying and declining, that, that pie wedge chart has gone down to about 5, 10 percent, depending once again on the title. Canadian films is different, right? You know, Canadian films were always notoriously thrown in the foreign film section or hidden somewhere and were never really displayed or bought en masse. So DVD revenue wasn't always a huge driver for Canadian films. It was always broadcast because of the CRTC regulations. But the point of the matter is when filmmakers have a film, they want to have a physical copy of that film out in the marketplace. And it kills me and breaks my heart sometimes when I have to talk to filmmakers I love and adore and just say, I, I can't do that without losing my shirt. Um, and then, of course, they turn around and ask about the new media, you know, the golden egg right now, iTunes, VOD. And the harsh reality is there's not a lot of revenue in those markets and the cost to put your film in those areas is, is pretty prohibitive. Um, you know, iTunes alone, I know we were discussing this earlier, can be as much as $1,500 to put your film on iTunes because they're now asking for closed captioning, et cetera. Um, you have to wait for the click and pays. And when you go into iTunes, unless you've got some great inroads with the people at iTunes or a great marketing device, you get thrown into the catalog. And as you know, for anyone who navigates iTunes, it's impossible to find something unless you know exactly what you're looking for. So I've had films on iTunes um, that over a year have generated only $120. So we're still trying to claw back that initial investment of money that we did. VOD is not dissimilar. Um, you know, to put your film on all the VOD stations across English Canada it can cost you as much as $8,000. And then once again, you have to sit and wait and watch for the money to sort of pop up. So DVD's dead. Uh, new media isn't quite the golden egg, not necessarily producing. Theatrical, as we know, is never a place where people should rely on making money. It's almost always a money loss. So what are we relying more and more on now is, is television sales. But now we're seeing in the Canadian television market, uh, certain broadcasters are shying away from their CRTC regulations or finding loopholes and producing their own product to fulfill that mandate. Uh, the license fees that were normally, let's say, you know, you could license a Canadian film to pay TV for as much as $200,000 about six years ago, have now dropped down to less than 50% of what they used to be. So, it, you know, outside of my company and who I am, what I'm seeing right now in our marketplace is a huge issue in regards to how we're supporting our industry. And yet, we're still going forward pretending nothing's wrong. Uh, it's a real big problem. So, I'm always cautious now when I'm dealing with Canadian films and funders and trying to navigate the best way possible that, you know, not only I as a businessman can make sure that my investment is recouped and, and safe, but also those individuals, the filmmakers who are the producers of product that drive this whole piece, don't die and become taxi drivers in no time because then if we have no more product, how are we going to run our industry? So it's, uh, it's bleak, I know, but I still have hope, otherwise I wouldn't be in this industry. Yeah, initially it went enormously well. You know, back when Blockbuster was around, um, I think they recognized what a lot of people are recognizing, which is documentaries are becoming a hot genre. Uh, not just with an older demo, but with a younger demo. I mean, if you talk to people like on, on iTunes and Netflix, um, they're the first ones to admit it, that documentaries are one of their top selling genres. So Blockbuster kind of recognized this, and they also recognized Hot Docs as a festival and as an entity was growing uh, exponentially. And they bought into the Hot Docs collection right off the bat, and they set up special shelves in all their stores across the country, stocked our units, gave us great encouragement that we need two or three Hot Doc titles a month. 
we went out purposely and we bought a bunch of other docs, some old, some new, to help feed this program. And after one month, Blockbuster decided to drop the program, you know, because their initial sales and expectations weren't up to snuff. Uh, that was discouraging, but at least the brand was out there and people started recognizing it. And the beauty was Hot Docs, the festival itself, was also massively supportive in regards to promoting it, helping sell the DVDs at their festival, uh, finding conduits for us to find uh, third-party organizations that may be able to buy certain product en masse. So I would say it's successful, maybe not as initially when it came out of the gate, but it's still a brand that brings us a lot of recognition. Um, and I know during the Hot Dogs Film Festival, um, Hot Dogs themselves get a lot of encouragement that this is a great idea, should keep it going. Um, we since then have now worked with Hot Dogs on branding a Hot Dogs channel on Air Canada, where once a month they will buy one of our Hot Dogs collection films and play it on Air Canada. Um, similarly, iTunes has started a Hot Docs uh, channel on iTunes as well. So everyone's sort of jumping aboard on the documentary bandwagon, and of course Hot Docs is the big flagship for that. So we're, you know, rightly so, we're piggybacking off that brand, um, which is, you know, a fair thing to say. I don't think anyone's really acknowledging that we're taking advantage of it. And of course, every Hot Docs DVD that we sell, we give a, a certain portion of the revenue back to Hot Docs, which goes to education and outreach. So it's a good news story, no matter how you look at it. Boy, what to look for when marketing to a Canadian audience. Um, you know, I'll back up a little bit and just, when I look at a project, I evaluate in three different levels. You know, first is obvious, is creative. You have to sort of really be passionate about the creative, the story, the script, uh, the vision of the director. Um, that's a pretty obvious thing to sort of buy into. The second is more the analytical business side, where you have to understand the business side of the equation. If I'm going to invest, which ultimately that is, we'll put money behind something, you want to make sure that that investment is going to get recouped at some point in time. The third part of the evaluation is a little bit more nebulous, and this is sort of answering that question, which is really about the filmmaker's expectations. Um, you know, we've walked away from films that have found success and we probably could have made money on, but it became apparent to us that what the filmmaker wanted to do with the film or what their expectations for the film and who their audience was and what we understood it was were kind of miles apart from each other. And I use always the analogy of if you're not getting along on the first date, why get married? You know, because it's just going to lead to heartache. Now, when I first started doing Kino Smith, I quote unquote whored myself out on some projects that I'm not exactly proud of. But you kind of have to do that to earn your wings and, and, and establish yourself and pay your bills. Um, so I kind of listen to my spidey sense a lot. You know, if someone comes and pitches me something that somehow doesn't sit well in my brain, even if I can't necessarily quantify it, I just won't touch it because chances are there's a reason I feel uneasy about it. Um, getting back to the question of how to market the Canadian films, well, you know, I always say this over and over again, which is, you know, and it's redundant. I know everyone says it, but no one really practices it, which is really understanding who your audience is. First and foremost, we should not be making movies to compete with the Americans. We just can't. There's an economy of scale there. Um, you know, the example I always use is, uh, I think the largest budget Canadian P&A, which is Prince and Advertising, you know, budget is for Passchendaele, which is rumored to be around four to five million dollars, which is the largest money any Canadian distributor spent on a Canadian film. Well, let's put it in context to Transformers. Maybe not the fairest comparison, but Transformers One had a twenty-five million dollar spend in Canada. Okay, let's throw Transformers out and let's look at that great auteur film, White Chicks, by the Whalen Brothers, which has got to be one of the worst movies ever made. That had an $8 million spend. So my joke is always, if we can't compete with the white chicks, then what are we doing? You know? um, and part of the problem is, you can have a great film, but if you can't get the awareness for that film out to the audience um, and validate that, that it's a real film, then you're never going to have success. So to me, if you're trying to market a film to teenagers, first and foremost, uh, chances are I'm going to shy away from it because that's the hardest demo to get the attention of. They have every person and product out there vying for their attention. Uh, so you're going to have to spend a lot of time and money to reach them and, and make this an authentic consumer piece for them. Um, where I would lean to is a film that might have a more discernible audience. Um, what attracted me back in the day to a film like Away From Her 
was the fact it was a film about seniors. And it was Alzheimer's, and it was Sarah Pauli. I mean, there was three elements right there, right off the bat, that you could tangibly put in your in your mitts and start marketing right away. Um, I knew that the older demo was a demo that was really underserved, but had been proven to go go to movies like Whales of August, etc., on on mass. So that was to me okay. You could tangibly see how you were going to market it. Um, similarly, with any sort of niche demo, if you've got um, a Jewish-themed film, you know, first thing that goes in my head is I know that Jewish audiences support going to the cinema uh, on on mass, and usually are uh, vora have a voracious appetite for cinema. Um, if you come to me with a Korean film, I may shy away from it. You know, I didn't in the past, but one of the things I found out with Korean films often is if you try to market a Korean film or a Chinese film to the Chinese community. More often than not, they've seen it via the black market, whatever. Their corner stores have copies. Or they're not going to trust Mr. White Guy selling them a Korean film. Um, so you can get around that by hiring certain people to help out. But it is really getting down to just understanding who that audience is and knowing what the makeup of Canada is. And Canada is so weird because geographically it's so spread out. And what works in Vancouver isn't necessarily going to work in Toronto and vice versa. And I think there's been valiant attempts like Men with Brooms, whether you like the film or not, I get it. I can understand why they made that film. Curling is a huge phenomenon across the country. So as a subject matter, it was a good stab. Trailer Park Boys, brilliant. You know, it's already an established brand, off to the races. But when we start doing Score the Hockey Musical, you start going, what the hell is going on here? You've got a film. Hockey fans don't like musicals for the most part. Musical fans don't like hockey. Like, what brain trust didn't figure this out to begin with, you know? So, um, you know, Breakaway is a different aspect of it. You know, I could almost buy into Breakaway more than I could score the hockey musical. But, you know, I guess people have to try these things and see what happens, you know? And it's a shame because in both cases, I'm a huge fan of the filmmaker. Uh, but you sort of wonder what they were smoking when they came up with that, you know? So. I think Goon helped it. I don't know if it solved it. Um, you know, I, I love Dosa's films. I think he's, he's a great filmmaker, and I think he made a, uh, I wouldn't call it a smart movie, because that's not a fair way of describing it, but I think he understood who his market was, and he really got it. It's essentially 2012's version of Slapshot, you know? Um, and sure, it's not a perfect movie, but I think it found the success it deserved, you know? It was a smart move. Um, alternatively from that, you take someone like Deepa Mehta's film Water, um, which I think was equally smart, you know, because there's a huge South Asian community in Canada that would maybe want to embrace it or be outreached by it. Either way, it's a great marketing tool. So it is about understanding who that audience is and how they consume film. Um, and the biggest problem I see is a lot of Canadian filmmakers are led down the road through development and development and development and told that their idea is good. And then when it comes down to people like myself who have to do that last little triggering scenario, we're going, well, how the hell is this going to work? I mean, the obvious example is try to compare your film to other films in the marketplace of same ilk. If those films didn't work, then what the hell are you doing? Uh, or if those films worked because they worked and they had a $25 million budget behind it, what the hell are you doing? So it's, um, there's a real disconnect, I think, in regards to people always say, my film will appeal to everyone. It's never true. You know, I, It will always have a core group of people who are going to be championing the film. And if they're behind it and it works, it will branch out to everybody eventually. But you can't make films for everybody. And I think as a, as a small little demographic community called Canada, we should be making films I wouldn't even necessarily say films for Canadians, but films for regional Canadians. Um, another great film, which I don't think had huge success back in the day, was Sterla Gunnison's Rare Birds, which I thought was a really smart Canadian film. You know, No one saw it, um, but it was a tangible film that you know how you could market it. And go figure, where did it do well? East Coast. And it was shot in the East Coast, and it had Andy Jones from Newfoundland in it, et cetera. But it was a smart, entertaining film and kind of had a William Forsyth sort of feel to it, um, which kind of appealed to the humor and the demo out there. So that's the type of stuff I like to see. I, I just don't want to see stuff that's kind of a pale imitation. Foolproof to me is you know, a great example where we tried to do something that we should never do, which is copy the Americans. Um, and obviously it failed miserably. 
Well, I, I think, you know, Canadian films as art films is interesting because I, I unequivocally will call Passchendaele to even a Michael Snow experimental film is all art films. I think within the context of mass consumption, Canadian films are unequivocally art films, even if you're trying to make the most commercial film possible, like Servitude that just came out recently. And that's getting back to the economy of scale comment. Um, but it's a weird one. You know, I think part of this has to get into public funding, you know, and the fact that films are made um, via taxpayers' money. So uh, back in the heyday of Canadian independent cinema of the 80s, you know, when Bruce MacDonald, Adam McGoy, and Patricia Rosema, all these people were making films that people complained about were too obtuse and too hard to get into. And I get it. In some of those cases, I totally get it. Um, but at least they were trying to tell unique stories. Um, I don't think that, you know, the term art film is, is such a, a turn off in some ways. But in a way, it's a, it's a real embracer. And if the filmmaker knows that they have a film that has a limited audience, then fine. I'll work with them in a second's notice. Like Daniel Coburn's uh, You Were Here, I think is a great movie. And the thing I loved about Daniel is that he, he knew who, who his audience was. And he knew that this was not going to be a humongous release. You know? But he, he definitely wanted it to be seen by certain individuals and in certain communities across the country. Ingrid Veninger does that extremely well as well. She makes movies that I think she wants as many people to see, but she, I think she knows who her audience is exactly, and she goes after them aggressively, and, and she gets them to come out en masse, which is fantastic. So if you made a comparison, I think, of, of quote unquote the art films and quote unquote the Canadian commercial films, I guarantee that you'd probably find more success with the art films than you would the commercial films. So. But it always gets down to this categorically obtuse, tough movies, dark movies, Canadian movies, and taxpayers putting money into it. Uh, and of course, you know, the government now has gotten really hypersensitive about it after the young people fucking, you know, title. And yet you watch the movie and it's so friggin' tame. But it was the title that triggered everyone. So, yeah, I don't know how to answer that 100%. I mean, there's part of me that really does want to harken back to the, the way that we made films in the 80s and 90s, which was total disregard of the U.S. system, but just trying to do our own thing. Um, but we're so obsessed with selling Canadian films to Canadians, and sometimes I think that's a real downfall. You know, to me, we're 2% of the global market. So I, I know it's important to have success in your home country, but... As we all know, Canadians tend to embrace things more if other people outside the country embrace it, you know? Um, and that, I think, is the bigger picture. If we're talking about investment, we're talking about everything, then, you know, if you want to recoup your investment as a taxpayer, then let's make films that may play in a more of a European setting. Let's face it, we have more European sensibilities than American sensibilities whether that's our commonwealth background or it's just kind of a fictional thing that we've made up in our head to make ourselves distinctly different than our American cousins, who knows? But um, I don't want to make a totally, you know, a 12-hour black and white, non-dialogue obtuse art film, but it's, I still have no problem with us making those type of films. In fact, <clears throat> as a fit, pretentious film school student, those were the films I loved. Um, but I'm also a Terminator fan, you know, and give me both sides of the coin any day. So knowing that we have limited budgets and knowing that we have a hard time finding a general mass audience, where's the harm in us going after more um, culturally diverse, more artistically driven type stories and films? That, to me, is probably what is going to be embraced more worldwide than our servitudes of the world. Um, and ultimately, if it's embraced worldwide, that is going to help drive our industry. Because it really gets down to paying filmmakers, i.e. selling their movie, it's also about creating jobs in our industry, and it's ultimately about keeping people like myself, distributors and sales agents and so forth, alive as well. We shouldn't be bitching and moaning to Cineplex about why they're not playing our films. It's more like, well, you know, let's, let's get into making some films that, that make sense and find a larger audience. By the way, I never buy into this argument that Cineplex never supports Canadian films. I actually think that they go far beyond the call of duty on that. Um, I've never in my whole history in existence have I been told no by them because it's a Canadian film. Um, they have no cultural mandate, right? They're, a, they're totally a corporation, so they don't have to play any Canadian films. Yet, if you look historically at the Canadian films that have been released, they've given a fair stab at almost all of them. Uh, 
that's a total weird off-track comment. But anyways, it, it's something I hear all the time. I hear about screen quotas and this and that, and I actually have big issues with that. I don't think screen quotas is the issue or the solution to the problem. You know, I think there is uh, less of a reputation of Canadian marketing materials in, in cinemas in, in across the country, but. Um, I, I think it's a, it's a bigger issue on the type of films that we're, we're funding, the type of films that we're making, the type of films that are being created. Um, mm. Yeah, the different type of docs. I mean, I've, I've always, you know, I mean, it, I know it's a real, everyone's used it and said it over again, but I actually find sometimes true stories more fascinating than fictional stories. And often fiction stories are based on true stories. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I've seen a lot of different changes in, in the way documentaries have been made. And you're right, there are those pure fact, sort of, I, I almost call them science docs, even if they're not a scientific nature. It's all about the facts and giving you the stats and off to the races. And then there's the more, dare I say, ob, um, I'm not going to say subjective docs, but the docs that, you know, tend to have the filmmaker almost as a character in the film. In fact, that's the one thing that has been driving me crazy. I've been seeing so many docs where the filmmaker is a character in the film, aka the Michael Moore, Morgan Spurlock syndrome. It drives me nuts, you know, and I don't know why it's happened all of a sudden. I think in some cases it's people who aren't necessarily good filmmakers but want to have some sort of notoriety. In other cases, I think it's filmmakers who are told that they should be making films about things they know and therefore the only thing they know is themselves or their immediate surroundings, so they have to therefore become a subject. Um, you know, but that also being said, I've also seen a whole wide variety of different type of docs, even docs that are kind of almost breaking the genre rules a little bit. You know, there's. Uh, uh, a UK documentary called The Arbor a little while ago, uh, which is just, I was completely captivated by it. A very dark, depressing story. Um, but at the same point, it was all actors lip syncing to actual audio tape recordings. And it worked. You know, uh, you quiz half of the people in the audience, I guarantee you they would never have known that would have been the case. So you are seeing a lot of different inventive tools out there. Um, I've seen audiences embrace all of these types, though. I, mean, I think the one encouraging thing I've found is, is documentary audiences seem to be growing. Uh, they're not necessarily of a certain demo. I've actually been really surprised that the younger audience is coming out to see docs or renting docs and so forth. And I think it's just always about finding information, you know, and it's, it's informing themselves. It's not necessarily taking everything as being the gospel, but. I think traditional media has become so whitewashed and so uh, pablum-like, you know, that people are want to dig around, whether it be on the internet or otherwise, and find out a little bit more about subject A, B, and C. And that's where docs kind of lend themselves really well. Um,